Every Java developer knows this line, but only few know the war it started. A programming language built to power consumer devices ended up threatening Microsoft and somehow caused betrayal, lawsuits worth billions, and a power struggle unlike any other. A language that promised write code once and run it anywhere. Welcome to the untold story of Java. The year is 1991. In a corner of Sun Microsystems, James Gosling, a Canadian computer scientist, is fed up with C++, segmentation faults, memory leaks, and platform-specific issues. Gosling, along with his team, Mike Sheridan and Patrick Norton, starts Project Green, an idea unheard of at the time, a language that could go beyond hardware limitations and run on any machine without modification. They soon create a prototype called Oak, named after the tree outside his office, but because of issues with trademarks, the name had to be changed. During a caffeine-fueled brainstorming session in 1994, they agreed on the name Java, inspired by their favorite coffee. Java's design principles were unique. Pure object orientation, automatic garbage collection, platform independence through the JVM, and memory safety to avoid buffer overflows. On May 23, 1995, Sun unveiled Java's alpha release. It was a hot Java browser running Java applets. Interactive content on the web for the first time, and that was when everyone started taking notice. Netscape immediately jumps on board and even renamed LiveScript to JavaScript to ride on Java's popularity. A few programmers called it a fad. After Netscape announced they would include Java support in their browser, the tech world took notice. For the first time, web pages could run sophisticated programs, not just display static content. Duke, Java's mascot, adorned t-shirts and badges as the community grew. By 1996, millions of developers were downloading the Java development kit, and Java One conferences became pilgrimages for developers. But while the Java community was celebrating its rapid rise, one man was watching with growing concern. Not from the fringes of the developer world, but from the very top of the tech empire. In Redmond, Washington, Bill Gates saw something others didn't. He recognized the threat immediately. If Java succeeded, it would break Microsoft's stranglehold on desktop computing. If applications could run on any operating system, Windows becomes just another platform instead of the dominant one. Microsoft's response was swift and calculated. They licensed Java from Sun, then created their own version with Windows-specific extensions that broke Java's cross-platform promise. It was simply Microsoft being Microsoft. Embrace, extend, extinguish. A classic move on their part. The battle lines were drawn. On one side was Sun Microsystems, fighting for an open, cross-platform future. On the other was Microsoft, defending its desktop empire. Microsoft's strategy was evil yet simple. They supported Java publicly while sabotaging it privately. Their version of Java included Windows-specific features that made programs run better on Windows but break on other platforms. Developers who used these extensions would unknowingly trap their applications in Microsoft's ecosystem. Sun Microsystems watched as their write once run anywhere promise crumbled. Java was being weaponized against itself. But Microsoft didn't stop there. They began promoting their own alternatives. The message was clear, why use Java when Microsoft's tools work better on Windows? For developers caught in the middle, it was a nightmare. Write pure Java and sacrifice Windows performance, or use Microsoft's extensions and abandon cross-platform compatibility. The technology that was supposed to liberate developers from depending on one platform was becoming a tool for platform warfare. Sun had to act fast or watch Java die a slow death by a thousand corporate cuts. In 1997, Sun Microsystems did something unexpected. They sued Microsoft for $1 billion, claiming breach of contract and trademark infringement. But before we dive into one of the biggest legal battles in tech history, let's take a quick break to hear from today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is transforming how we learn, helping you get smarter every day with interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and AI. Their hands-on approach is proven to be 6x more effective than traditional lecture videos, making it the perfect resource for developers looking to build real-world skills. Their newly updated Programming with Python course will help you build a solid foundation in coding, develop an intuition for computer logic, and think like a programmer by breaking down complex problems into simple, understandable steps. You even start writing programs from day one, and right now, you can try everything Brilliant has to offer free for 30 days at brilliant.org slash codesource, or by scanning the QR code on screen. Plus, you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Don't miss this chance to learn in minutes a day, now, back to our story. The lawsuit wasn't just about money, it was about the soul of Java. Would Microsoft be allowed to hijack an entire technology ecosystem? While the legal battle with Microsoft raged in the courts, Java was quietly conquering a different battlefield. By 1998, Java wasn't just running in browsers anymore. 
Sun forms the Java community process, bringing IBM, Oracle, and other giants into the fold. Instead of fighting competitors, they made them stakeholders. Then came J2EE in 1999. Enterprise Java was born. XML configuration files everywhere. EJBs that required three interfaces for a simple bean. Some developers started to joke that J2EE stood for just too much Enterprise Edition. But despite its complexity, it worked. Banks trusted Java with transactions. Airlines ran booking systems on it. E-commerce sites scaled to millions of users. Meanwhile, Apache built an entire ecosystem, Tomcat for web servers, and later Maven for builds. The community was building faster than Sun could standardize. But while Java applets aimed to bring animation and interactivity to websites, they eventually struggled. They depended on external software and led to compatibility, performance, and security issues. The rise of Flash and JavaScript offered faster, more accessible web interactivity. However, the real power of Java wasn't in browsers. It was on the back end. The internet was changing from just sharing information to running applications. The Microsoft lawsuit exposed the depths of their plan. Internal emails showed executives discussing how to kill cross-platform Java and make it die a quiet death. But Microsoft fought back. They claimed they were simply innovating, adding features that developers wanted. Why should Java be held back by Sun's limitations? The case dragged on for years, consuming millions in legal fees and creating uncertainty throughout the developer community. Meanwhile, Microsoft wasn't sitting idle. In 2000, they announced .NET, their answer to Java. C Sharp looks suspiciously similar to Java, but it was Microsoft's Java, designed for their ecosystem. In 2001, the companies reached a settlement. Microsoft agreed to pay Sun $20 million and stop distributing their incompatible version of Java. But by then, the damage was done. Java had survived, but it was wounded. The browser wars had moved on, and Java applets were increasingly seen as slow and insecure. But this setback would prove temporary. Java was about to find its true calling in the enterprise world it had already begun to dominate. With the Microsoft threat neutralized, Java could focus on what it did best, running serious business applications. When the community fought back against J2E's complexity, Rod Johnson created Spring Framework in 2003, which made enterprise Java development sane again. Dependency injection became simple, configuration became manageable, and Java development became fun again. Eclipse gave developers a proper IDE that could compete with anything Microsoft offered. Struts simplified web development. The Java ecosystem was maturing rapidly. Java's conservative evolution became its superpower. While other languages chased trends, Java protected billions of dollars in enterprise investments. Code from 2000 still runs on Java 21. By 2005, Java became more than just a language. It became a platform, an ecosystem, and a career path. Java developer became the most in-demand job title in tech. But Java's success brought pressure from a new front. The open source movement demanded Java's source code. In 2006, Sun CEO Jonathan Schwartz drops a bombshell at Java 1. Java is going open source. The world of programming celebrated. OpenJDK launched in 2007, but Sun kept the TCK, test compatibility kit, locked down. Apache wasn't happy because they were building Apache Harmony, a cleanroom Java implementation, but couldn't certify it without the TCK. The drama escalated quickly as Apache stormed out of the Java community process in protest. Then 2009 hits. Sun was bleeding money and Oracle swooped in for $7.4 billion. While Java was saved, its future now depended on a database company known for aggressive licensing. The fallout was immediate. James Gosling, Java's creator, resigned in protest and other Sun engineers followed. The community panicked. Will Oracle kill Java? While the community was panicking, Oracle wanted Google to pay for Android's use of Java APIs, but negotiations failed. And so in October 2010, Oracle sued Google for $9 billion. The lawsuit asked an important question. Can you copyright an API? Oracle said yes. Google said it's fair use. The tech industry held its breath. 2012, Google won round one. The judge ruled APIs aren't copyrightable, but Oracle appealed. The case went through courts for years, finally ending at the Supreme Court in 2021 with Google's victory. But Oracle wasn't just causing controversy. They began to accelerate the release cycle, delivered Java 8's lambdas, and modernized the platform. Java 8 in 2014 changed everything. Lambdas arrived, bringing functional programming to the masses. Suddenly, Java felt modern again. Oracle switched to six-month releases. Java 9 brought modules. Java 10 added VAR. Java 11 became the new LTS. Each release brought incremental improvements instead of waiting years for big bangs. Java powers 85% of smartphones through Android. Billions of devices. Your banking app, your Netflix stream, your Minecraft world, all powered by Java. The JVM became a platform for other languages. 
Scala brought type safety, Kotlin made Android development pleasant, Groovy added dynamic features, and Clojure brought Lisp to the JVM. The platform that started as Write Once Run Anywhere became Write Once Run in Any Language. Java 21 dropped the biggest change since Lambdas, virtual threads from Project Loom. Traditional Java threading sucked for high concurrency apps. Each thread mapped to an OS thread. When you create 10,000 threads, your server dies. This forced complex async programming with callbacks and futures. The virtual threads changed the game. This meant millions of virtual threads on a single machine, no callback hell, no reactive programming complexity, just simple, readable code that scales. Spring Boot applications see 10x throughput improvements with one configuration change. Suddenly, Java web servers can handle Node.js level concurrency with traditional blocking code. The Java community is currently awaiting Project Valhalla, value types that will make Java performance competitive with C++. Project Panama opens native interop for machine learning and high-performance computing, and pattern matching is making Java syntax more expressive. From Oak to Java, from Applets to Enterprise, from Sun to Oracle, Java's evolution has been remarkable. Java survived the dot-com crash, Microsoft's attacks, corporate acquisitions, legal battles, and countless Java is dead predictions. It adapted without breaking backward compatibility. It embraced functional programming without abandoning object orientation. It modernized while staying reliable. Although created around the same time as Delphi, Ada 95, Cold Fusion, and Perl, Java isn't your grandfather's verbose enterprise language. It's a modern, performant platform that powers everything, from Android apps to Netflix's backend, from trading systems to Mars rovers. The language that promised write once, run anywhere, became the foundation of our digital world. And with virtual threads, value types, and pattern matching on the horizon, Java's next chapter might be its most exciting yet. So the next time you write, remember, you're not just writing code, you're continuing a legend.